Go ahead when you're ready. Hey, Batman fans. Welcome to a podcast about me. I'm filling in for that whip, Larry Vasquez. Batman? <laughs> Gotta go. Hello, all you animation fans, and welcome to another Animate Podcast. You're listening to episode 27. I'm your host, Larry Vasquez, and joining me in this co-hosting is Rick Arroyo. How you doing, buddy? Doing great. We have so many things to talk about, Larry. I just, I just can't wait to start. All right, all right. Well, we've got also a great guest in this podcast, Matthew DeMuro, who is a lead animator on a very, very funny movie, the Lego movie. They're at Animal Logic. He's worked over at Frame Store and now currently over at ILM working on Transformers 4. So I'm really looking forward to talking to him mostly about the Lego movie. I had a chance to take my family out to that one and we were dying laughing. So uh, looking forward to talking with him about that. Ready to jump into the podcast? Absolutely. All right, let's do it. Hey, Matt, thank you very much for joining us. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. My pleasure to be chatting with you guys. You don't have much of an accent. I know. Uh, I grew up, I kind of grew up with uh, a lot of English speaking kids. Okay. So I was like playing soccer when I was like four or five or whatever with like English speaking kids. So I think that helped. And I had a babysitter that was perfectly bilingual. So, okay. <laughs> I don't talk like this, you know, not like George St. Pierre. <laughs> I can always tell Canadian by the way they say about. A boot? Yeah, a boot. And, and the worst thing is we don't like to do it. And then once in a while you catch yourself and like, ah. Oh. <laughs> we know you're busy. Uh, you're deep in the trenches over at ILM working on the next Transformers, which we can't get into. That's correct. At, at least not this roll around. But this will give us a good opportunity to get you in on another time, maybe after Transformers. Yeah, so. absolutely. All right. So, yeah, first of all, really do appreciate your time. I know it's you've been busy, so thank you. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Well, first off, uh, tell us a little about yourself, how you got into animation, your background a little bit, and then uh, we'll get into how you know Rick and David. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I've been animating for 14 years now, I think, 13, 14. Um, I started same time as Richie. First don't, job. don't put my age out there, man, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't say maybe you started really, really young. <laughs> 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 or maybe it was later in life, who knows? <laughs> So we started off uh, in Montreal, um, so smaller productions. Um, we were lucky enough to have a really, really uh, talented group. And I think we all learned a lot from each other. Um, not a lot of the programs at the time offered kind of in-depth uh, animation um, training or anything like that. So it was all a bunch of passionate people kind of learning together. And then we were lucky enough to kind of become this kind of mobile group of people <laughs> that wouldn't go off from project to project. So we had this amazing chemistry and it allowed us to kind of get better. Everybody got, everybody got, you know, a lot better from just being around each other and, and always being able to be honest with each other and look at the work and go, dude, that's not working. And never, you know, you always, when you, when it's friends and it's people that you care about, you know, that they're being, you know, they're being honest and they're not, they're not just trying to put you down just for, you know, for no reason. So it was, it was a great environment for us to learn. And then over time, most of us just gradually started to, to move away in the U.S. I went to Australia. So I worked in Australia for on and off for the last eight, almost nine years. Wow. Okay. So I went there for Happy Feet, the first one. And then I've done projects, you know, in London, in uh, Montreal again, and then San Francisco for Transformers 3. And then back to Australia. So back and forth like that. And that's where I did the Lego film. That's, yes, which I'm looking forward to talking about. Yes. Had a chance to see it this last Thursday and absolutely yeah. loved it. Yeah, sure. the, took the whole family, really, really liked it. Yeah. So. That's yes. great. I keep I keep getting like like messages on my Facebook. My cousins are taking their nephews and everybody's like, yay, this is so much fun. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. Uh, see here. Absolutely. I think I laughed definitely more out loud than anybody else in the theater. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. I posted on our community. Yeah. I said, hey, does anybody know any animators who's worked on the Lego movies? I, the Lego movie. I got to get someone in here for a podcast. And so David Hubert shot me out an email. He's like, hey, look, why don't you ask me? I know somebody, you know? And so give us a little bit of a background where you, how you know David as well. So David I met, uh, and Richie was also involved with this project. Um, we worked on Pinocchio 3000. Mm. This is a little while back. Yeah. And Dave was, uh, this is the first time meeting Dave. So like I was saying, we're this crew that kept moving around from projects. And then along the way, we met Dave on this this project. 
So there was a night shift, and my team ended up being on his, like with his team on the night shift. So we'd have little beer runs once in a while, <laughs> and um, and I, I got to know him a little bit. And then later on, we uh, both worked in the UK, and that's when me and Dave actually got close. Like you know, we spend more time together. And then sometimes when you're abroad, it's kind of cool because you know you kind of you kind of go, oh, well, you know, like we didn't hang out in Montreal that much, but. Let's do something, and then he was working on um, um, uh, Hellboy. So that was really exciting. He got promoted to being a lead on the show, and he got these great shots to do. So it was fun to talk about what he was working on. I was working on Tale of Despero, which didn't do very well, but it was a great learning experience and a really, really fun project to be on. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I like that one. Cool. Um, very, very European, kind of more subdued um, in, in the acting and stuff like that. But it was just cool. Like, So he, you know. It was nice to, to get, you know, we went on holidays together and stuff like that. So we got, you know, became good friends and then always kept in touch since then. Awesome. All right. Yeah. So now you said you worked on the Transformers 3 then? Yes. Okay. So we can get a little bit into that one at least, huh? A little bit of that one, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Well, let's talk about Lego. So you mentioned you were, you've worked over at Animal Logic, right, before? Yes. Been a, I started there, uh, like I said, a long time ago on uh, Happy Feet, uh, first first one, first Happy Feet. Mm -hmm. And then I came back for Legend of the Guardians. That was way slick. I, I dig that one, too. Cool. Um, yeah, so I became a lead on that show. And then um, I worked, I came back for the Polar Bear, the Coca-Cola Polar Bear short. Um, and then the Super Bowl ads that we did. And then that rolled on to WWD. Um, the dinosaur film that came out maybe, was it four months ago, five months ago? And wow. then after that was the Lego film. Okay. So now you, you're working back and forth between Australia and the U.S. then? Uh, yes, the last few times around, yes. Okay. So now you know contacts over at in, in Australia that you get back hooked up when another project comes up? Or how does that work for you? Um, well, I mean, so far it's just been kind of like I'm happy to be back closer to home and closer to friends and stuff like that. So I'm not sure what the future holds. I mean, I would never be against going back to Sydney. It's such a beautiful place, and the people there are really nice. I've got tons of friends in the company, so like you said, it's pretty much that. Like I'll, you know, I I stay in touch with them, find out what's going on, and if they don't want to have me back, I'm often happy to be <laughs> to go back. Awesome, yeah, because we pose questions to our community as well and kind of get some feedback. And um, Frank Gashk, who's actually from Australia, he asked, "How was it collaborating with Australians? Are they from another planet or what?" <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I think actually, well, well, it's funny because being from Montreal and, and uh, having uh, our type of sense of humor and our type of culture, there's, there's, uh, and maybe being East Coast as well, there is a difference in the way we communicate. And sometimes we might be a bit more blunt. <laughs> maybe me, Richie can, Richie can attest to that. He's blunt. <laughs> but we love him. Australians are a lot like that. <laughs> so Australians are a lot like that. So it's, it, it, it's it's a very yeah it wasn't a very big transition i mean the language is you know you, the accents you get used to and it's you know it's not a big uh wasn't much of a challenge or they're very very creative people and there's a lot of great um there's a lot of great uh short film festivals and stuff like that and people are very very creative so i think i think on that level the people that i've worked with that are australians because there's also a lot of international people mm. that work there um they're very very talented people so it's really good all right. So now, did you start at the beginning of production on the Lego movie? Or you jumped midway. No, I did not. I was still on the, um, the walking with dinosaurs. Okay. So, but I did. I, I kept peeking in, seeing what the guys were doing, because there was at, at the beginning for the most part of the film. Well, actually, we were three leads the entire time. And when I I had to leave before uh, the end of the the end of the show, my contract was over, and I was um, I was already I'd already agreed to work on Transformers. Okay. So um, and then another lead replaced me or took over my team. So total, there was four leads. So there were two guys mainly at the pre-prod uh, process. So they did a great job and collaborating with the directors and finding the styles for the, the brick blur stuff. And the, like even the style, and the style animation took a long time to develop, but they spent tons of time exploring and had tons of amazing stuff that I hope, you know, I hope they publish on the DVD or Blu-ray or something. Because the guys like the it's uh, Jim Dodd and David Williams did yeah really really good work. Okay, so let's add, let's talk about style then for a moment. Then yeah. so was you said they kind of explored different styles of what they were looking to to achieve then here, huh? Yes. What were some of the other styles if you if you can think you can talk about well, that? Well, I can tell you a little bit. So 
even at the beginning, it was still a, a very much an exploration, and the directors were to very very um, uh, open to to ideas and to like, oh, if it works in the shot, let's do it. Let's just do it, whatever works for the shot. But after a while, what happened is people got a little confused and like, well, am I animating on ones? Is it just twos? Is it this and that? And people were looking for rules to follow. And it took a little bit of time for us to, to develop what worked and what didn't. And for the most part, if you, if you, you know, it's mainly on twos. And I know for my team, I, I made a big point to, 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 to enforce that. But it took a while. So for a while, we're like, okay, so if we've got to speed up something, you put on ones. And then you, you know, and we kept trying to go in, in you know, through ones into twos and then maybe on threes and stuff like that. And just try to kind of take a more 2D approach. Mm. But then people kept going towards the ones more and more and more. And then all of a sudden it looks blind. And you're like, well, no, we've gone too far. And people are like, well, but you know, it kind of looks good because we're animated. We like it to be smooth and, and all clean and all that. And so that was the first thing to kind of break and kind of go, right, well, it's, it needs to look, to have that kind of charismatic appeal that the little Lego guys have, we had to, to, to kind of fall back into a more 2D look, or stop motion look, rather. Right. And then the second thing is all of us kept wanting to, to break the figurines, to overlap the body and kind of, you know, and then rock the head so that if the character's doing this, you've got that, that kind of kind of 2D feel like that, right? Uh -huh. So, and then the directors were adamant that this was a guy in his basement making a 2D film. Not a big studio. The idea is it's this dude in his basement and he can't afford many figurines to break and do all this. So that was the idea. And for the most part, like, we were very reluctant at the beginning. All of us animators were like, no, no, it looks cooler when it overlaps. It looks cooler. And then in the end, when you stop doing that stuff and you, you pivot it from the base as if it's a kid playing with a little Lego guy, it was that much more appealing. And for the most part, it never felt like we missed that overlap. Mm -hmm. So you'd get a new guy, he would do it, and I'd go, okay, take the same animation, take out all the break, you know, the breaks that you've put in the body and the head, and let's just see what it looks like. And then they'd play and go, oh, that's kind of cool. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're like, well, there you go. Uh -huh. So stop doing it. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the things I really enjoyed about the movie was just – the break from a maybe traditional style, but it, how it felt very playful. Yes. Now coming from your animation background where you're having to do a lot of the overlap and not be able to do that, did it free you up in a different creative way? Yes. Cause I'm, I'm reading an article. I think it was on, um, I forget the name of it, VFX Insider or whatever. And, um, they were talking about how you want to do like a shoulder shrugs and stuff. So can you explain kind of maybe how, well, there's a whole, there was a whole other debate there because we did do shoulder shrugs and there's plenty of times where the arms just translate up and okay. that got by. Um, and sometimes you'd get a no, no, get the shoulders out. No, I think it was picking the right moments where, you know, that was what needed to be communicated. But um, I think you touched on something when, uh, when you said like, like limiting, taking out the overlap and all that stuff is that. And same with what the directors pushed really, really adamantly about the jokes is that you want to get to the core of the idea. The idea is what's important and not necessarily how pretty the movement is. So the joke or the gag or the, 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 the gesture, because they don't have fingers, sometimes just getting the right angle on the hand mm -hmm. and just sticking the pose, is, it was stronger and funnier and more interesting than, than putting a little bit of an overlap on the thing or rotating the hand. So... And it's hard because you, you know and you're tired trying to tell your team, what, you know, but you don't you don't feel like you feel like you want to put in some overlap, but you're like, no, it's fine. You don't need to touch it anymore. It's it's good. It's funny. So and I'll and I think that allows you to have more time to maybe play with ideas. Okay. Or try to find a different idea, or because you know you don't have to put in as much. Did you guys shoot much reference for this kind of stuff? I thought we were going to shoot more. Uh, we didn't. Uh, we didn't shoot a whole lot. Um, one of the, my favorite references, and that one I hope they put on the on the Blu-ray. So I don't want to spoil anything, but there's a there's a character that looks like he's on a string. Mm -hmm. Well, the animator took the toy, put it on a string, filmed <laughs> it, and, 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 and found what worked and timed it so you know it would play the camera when it needed to. Okay. But based his animation on him just playing with the string, which I thought. Uh. Was, Genius. Yeah, yeah. It looks so good. And you could never <laughs> animate that. No. Uh, <laughs> and that's one of the things, like, uh, I noticed when I first saw the trailer, I think it was back in late summer-ish. Yeah. It looked like it was stop motion. I Actually, that's what I thought it was. Yeah. Um, well, go ahead. 
that was that was just I I think for us when the trailer went out, um, some of us were kind of like, oh, we don't know about this trailer. What does it communicate about the film? Uh, so we're kind of not sure. And the response was fantastic. So the first thing that that we saw is these people debating on the YouTube like you know comments saying. No, no, it's stop motion, you moron, or this and that, and people just debating and arguing and bickering over what how it was made. And for the majority, it, it sounded like people were saying, no, it's stop motion. It's just they've enhanced it in post to make it look prettier. And we're all like, we did it! Uh-huh. We made it look like stop motion! <laughs> so we're really, really excited, and we're like, because that's what we're going for. And then, you know, just like when you're working on your own piece, after a while, you kind of start thinking, oh, is this... Is this good enough? Is this, you know, so we were kind of feeling that a little bit. And then that was, that was great. And then also seeing the response from, from the community and people that we work with or that we know overseas going, oh, dude, I, I thought it was going to be, you know, a horrible thing. But now I'm really excited about this thing. It looks great. So that was really, really encouraging. You guys had me at the first trailer. I was, I was hooked. <laughs> That's good. But I think the stop motion look gave it that ability to, to use the limited constraints within the animation. I think that's yeah. what helps sell, uh, sell it. I think so. And I think the directors were right on, on a lot of the calls where we wanted to push things a bit more, break things a bit more. And they were really adamant about, no, 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 this is how it has to look. And I think they, they were absolutely right. Yeah. I think it gave more to the gags as well. Um, yes. Yeah. Th- there's one part, and I, again, I'm, I'm trying to keep this spoiler free because that drives me crazy on spoilers. Um, but one of them does quotes, air quotes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it just, yeah. when you got these yeah. cups for hands, you know, it just, it, that's what makes it so much funnier than normal. Yeah. The, um, they did an audition piece, um, I guess to, 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 to sell the project or to, it was like this audition piece with Emmett and in the dialogue, he kind of goes, meh. So the animator couldn't do this. Mm-hmm. So he just put his hand in it. <laughs> but, and I remember seeing it and thinking that's genius. Mm-hmm. It's so simple, but it, it communicates exactly what it needs to communicate. And it's just a stupid little yellow hand just turning. I was like, that's great. And the timing obviously was well executed. But I just thought there's so much potential. And what was really cool is the more um, new animators would come in, they would come in and, and pick up the style maybe a bit quicker than us because they don't have to, to go through all the growing pains of what we're exploring this and that. And then would, they'd come in with new ideas and new ways to execute gestures or or – just ideas and be like, oh, we could do that as well. That's, a, that's, that's fantastic. And then we just kind of. Isn't that funny how the constraint actually makes things, you have to start exploring different venues. Yeah. yeah. You get more creative in a way. Yeah. So now what was your role on the movie? Um, so I was a lead. So okay. at Animal Logic, um, they tend to work with teams. And um, depending on the shows, you have whatever, how many leads that they decide to have. So on Lego, there was three teams. I think we're up to 10, 12 animators maybe. Per team? Yes. And so your allocated sequences that you take from, you know, beginning to final. Um, and that's kind of how it works. So it's pretty cool. You get the sequence, you look at it, you, you kind of discuss it with the director well, or, you know, the animation director, and he'll, he'll tell you what they want. And then you can discuss ideas, and sometimes you can say, oh, and because also uh, Chris McKay, who was the animation director on the show, is also an, an editor. So he would actually re-edit stuff, and then you can say, oh, can we cut this and maybe do this? And we kind of pitch ideas, and he'd be well up for any kind of kind of back and forth like that. Does that help with having someone who has an animation background? Uh, yeah, because it was cool. He would tell us all these great robot chicken stories. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah, we used to do this, and we just to glue this thing and just shake the table and this and that. And then like, oh, all right, okay. <laughs> But it's interesting to see that, like, you know, we, you can see where he's coming from. And then sometimes it's, it's, you know, Robot Chicken is really funny. But what's funny is is they sometimes let the gags play out without too much, you know, too much uh, embellishments. Mm-hmm. Which is what we were sometimes trying to do with the characters, trying to put too much. And they're like, no, no, just let the gag play itself. Like, just let the gag be kind of thing. Which is so, really cool. So what is something that you felt like you've taken away from the Lego movie? I mean, because obviously jumping into a new movie like Transformers, vastly, vastly different. So what, yeah. do, you, what do you take from the Lego movie that you now you take to, for the rest of your career? Well, I think I think it's just maybe, I think it's maybe more like I was saying about the gags and stuff like that and saying, you know, you can, and and letting letting the ideas maybe show a little bit more or and not over animate something potentially. Okay. But that's always been kind of a, 
it depends on the shows that you're on. And sometimes they want overacted stuff. And sometimes, like I was saying about Despero, it was very much kind of European sensibilities where they want, no, no, subdue it, tone it down, just a little hand gesture, not a big, broad gesture. Um, I don't know. It's, I think it's, it was just a fun experience. I mm. think that's, in terms of learning as a skill, it's just, you know, it, it's a different style. And I, actually, uh, it's kind of a lesson that any show you go on to, you should try to observe and uh, and 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 take on what the style of the show is going to be, and figure out what your what your the goal is. So if it's a if it's a somewhat realistic like Guardians, which has certain dynamics that are realistic, but overall is more kind of animated, then you kind of have to you know you don't want to go there and do Pixar. So maybe and even though you might be the biggest Pixar fan and you know exactly how to do their style, that's not what's required. So for the Lego film, even though you want to come in and go, I'm going to animate on ones because I my stuff looks better on ones. Well, actually, it's a movie that's going to be look like stop motion, mm. and then just try to embrace the style and try to go for it. Very good. So, I, so we have uh, Warren Seeley who asked, "What was it like the first day and last day of production for you?" Um, the first day was just trying to look as as much material as possible. The directors had tons, tons of footage. And they actually had this really cool thing where it was them commenting on the footage. So sometimes it'd just be live action. Go, oh, I like how this guy does this thing. And then sometimes they'd be like Wallace and Grummet. Say, look how cool that little, and they'd find these little details that, you know, kind of animators would look at and go, oh, isn't that cool how that little toe does this before the movement? And it's just to anticipate and this and that. So they would find little things like that that would be like, okay, that's, that's how they're looking at it. And that's how they're going to approach looking at our work. So, okay, that's interesting. So there's more of that. And then the first day you get to do walk cycle. That's the funniest thing. You've got this little thing on your computer. going do, 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 and just, you know, <laughs> trying to walk over the pegs. And it's just the funniest thing. And you're just there giggling. And that was the one thing that happened to me on the show is I kept giggling all the time. You just hit play because a lot of them, you know, if you're kind of without the facial and stuff like that, they just go you know, real time and just hit play and just see these little dudes doing stuff. And you're like, they're so cute. Look at them go. This is so cool. So that's, yeah. <laughs> now, had you worked with Soft Image before? Yes. So, okay. yeah, I'd worked in Montreal with uh, Soft Image uh, 3, 7 or 3, 9. And then uh, Pinocchio was done uh, with XSI, and then Animal Logic. Most of the productions I've worked on there have been uh, XSI. I just want to add that his he has a terrible giggle. That's one thing I want to throw in there <laughs> because we got this brotherly love going on. So I just want to throw that in in case we use it and make it public. I used All to right. scare Richie in my first job, <laughs> and and I I used to call him uh, I used to call you Dave. Was it yeah, Dave? For I used? A bit. Yeah. Yeah. For the first like three weeks, inside yeah. inside joke, for the first three weeks when we were working together in Montreal, you know, he just introduces himself as Matt and me being me. I'm like, wow, that's not his name. It is. It doesn't fit him. So I start calling him Dave, <laughs> and he's not the only animator that I know in no. this world that I've done that. I, yeah. I was like, hey, Dave, I keep calling him Dave. So we have some good history, and I yeah. used to steal. I used to steal his lunch. I found he, that he. Rich told me I think two years <laughs> later. And I was like, you know what? I actually remember going, I was sure I brought... No, you caught me. You caught me. <laughs> oh, that's right. But you were going through somebody else's lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, dude, you going through lunches? He's like... Uh, we're family. We're, fam we're family. That's, that's, how, that's how we roll. When we're family, you know, it's, it's, it's a badge of honor. He's like, so. hey, tell your wife thanks for the lunch. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they were good lunches, too. So right. I'm sorry, we can get back on track now. <laughs> Let's throw that in there. So I want okay. to talk about the facial on Lego. Sure. How did that work? Because you're working at what looks like to be kind of a 2D image. Yeah. Is that how they? Is that what they were, or how did that work? The uh, facial system. It was. It was more of um. It was in. So the the rigging department figured out a way to do it with the uh, XSI. Uh, splines and stuff like that. So it was almost like like working with like an illustrator or like with vectors and just pulling tangents. And so obviously when they started, they made a library where you had a lot of basic shapes and then you would go in and, and rework them for what you wanted, sometimes for the angles you want, and, you know, so thick and thin. And, and sometimes the directors wanted stuff that wasn't too perfect. So a lot of times you get a shape and you go, oh, you know, it's a bit wonky here, so I'll just make it perfect. 
And then no would be like, well, it's a little too perfect. Let's just <laughs> smudge it. Because, if, you know, if you look at the detail in the film, they have got the, the sticker lines and, and uh, you know, like stickers, if you put them under a microscope, they don't, they're not perfect. Mm. So they, they wanted that and they want the imperfections to be in there. So um, that was very time consuming. The facial was very, very time consuming. But it, it's also, you know, it, it, it was the opportunity to be able to draw your own, pretty much your own shapes, mm. which was pretty cool. Now, if you guys didn't do much reference, what were you looking or how, how did you get your acting choices and, and your facial gestures? Um, Old school mirror up or, or? Yeah, mirror or you just kind of, well, there's a few. Yeah, we did act out a few kind of facial stuff. Um, did you I do mean, much thumbnailing? Actors, what's that? Did you do much thumbnailing? Uh, I didn't. Some of the guys did. Okay. Um, we also had, we had very kind of tight deadlines in a way. So people kind of stuck to, and there's, 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 Sometimes working on the one expression that really captures the, the, the moment and then just really kind of agonizing that shape would be, you know, and if you're going to be drawing on a pad, you might as well be drawing it on your screen because you're working on the one image mm. to really nail. So you, you're adjusting the eye corner, the angle to look correct and all that stuff. So and I think it's more about that than actually going through and, and, and just, you know, kind of doing it in a more traditional way where you would be kind of exploring. I mean... We did for the, there's a few more emotional scenes um, that I'm, I can't, I'm not sure how the guys approached it, but I have a feeling that they probably did a bit more research into filming themselves or, 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 or drawing stuff out a bit more. I, I want to say something really quick, and Matt, correct me if I was wrong, um, because the way we have learned, uh, you know, we, I guess, you, I wouldn't say old school, we come from this, like, this, this, I don't know how to learn on the job. Train. Learn on job. Um, I find that we have a certain way to envision something in, in our heads, and we're able to put it on screen. And um, I notice a lot of us. I mean, we still, you know, do reference. You know, yeah. we, we we you know, it's it's a it's a great way to you know push a shot. But I find a lot of like us from our group were able to vision and then put it directly on screen, even like without doing any thumbnails or. Or using any pictures, we just found yeah. ways to kind of maybe we would step off from our from our desk and not, like you know to feel out the animation and then just put it. I mean, do you do you find that uh, it's hard to find animators with that type of vision or that ability think, to do that? I think one of the really good things about coming from a place where we we went from a, a school that would just teach you a program, not really the artistic side, and kind of luckily you do a demo reel that's half decent and a company picks you up. And in our case, we had our first job was was a very kind of cartoony and interesting show. It was a German show, so we didn't do the lip sync. <laughs> and it was these 30-second clips. But we had to produce 30 seconds of animation a week. So there's not a lot of room for error. And there's not a good – because if you make a mistake and you have to redo a section of your thing, you're, you're there all night. So you you quickly learn to have strong poses – and you animate, well, we started with pose to pose. Like there was no, there was not, not much in between. And sometimes if you were quick enough, you'd get to go and polish some overlaps and stuff like that. So we'd put breakdowns sometimes to, as you're blocking and kind of go straight forward. And, and that was, I think, a great way for us to learn and, and to be efficient and to be, and to think about something as opposed to exploring it on the computer. So I think like, I see that a lot where uh, animators will kind of not really think about what their shot means or, you know, or, or the, the, what they want to communicate with it. And they just kind of go right into it. And then and then they kind of explore and it takes them a long time because they're trying, trying, going back over the thing, going back over. Well, I'll adjust that pose later. I know the arm has to be up, but I'll, that's fine. I'll do that later. Well, if you're going to put down a pose, you might as well think about it and try to make it as nice as possible. And and I think that's the school that we came from, where if you did that, you you just ran out of time at the end of the week. Yeah, it's, it was really important to be able to observe extremely fast, uh -huh. have a clear idea, and you yes. know, and it was really the communication and getting that clear gesture and making sure that you were able to hit it at yeah. when you have to do thirty seconds and sometimes forty. Yeah. But it, <laughs> in, but even in like two to three second, you know, like whatever, like the, the the big features that we do now, the shots, the same, the same. It's still the same idea where, you know, a shot has an idea and a goal. You want to communicate a piece of information. 
And if it's muddled and trying to, you know, either do too much or put too much subtext or this or that, in the end, the shot, when a viewer sees it, it's like that and that's it, it's gone. And you want to pass the message. And if there's a room for the subtext, great. But let's get the idea across. And that's, let's not try to, to make it. A, and then there's the whole also, like, is this a demo shot? Or, you know, people wanting to do too much for the shot, understanding where your shot lies. And we were kind of lucky because we would get a 30 second, which would be an episode. So you would get the different shots. So you got to do the episode. Mm -hmm. And then you had to figure out your cut. So you're like, okay, well, this shot, all he has to do is blink in this one. And then the next one is when he screams. I don't need to set it up here. It's in the next one. It's fine. And we kind of got to learn that, I think, which was actually pretty helpful. Are there any things that you would maybe suggest for students then to develop this kind of skills? Um, well, I mean, it's all like, I mean... I would say if you could if you could do exercises at home and 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 find an idea and give yourself a very strict timeline and see what you can achieve. Okay. And then maybe I mean it's almost like doing doing um uh, live model drawing. Mm. If you got a thirty second sketch to do when you start the first time I did a thirty second drawing, I think I got an arm in uh, a side of a rib and maybe half a leg. <laughs> and then you're like oh, and then the next class you're like okay I'm gonna at least finish one, and then the next one you almost <laughs> finish, and then at the end of the class you do you do a full you know, the full, and then often they would actually look nicer. The weight would be kind of, you know, not perfect, but it'd feel more, more kind of fluid and there's something appealing to it. And you even had time to start putting in little eyes and stuff. Cause like, Oh, I got eight seconds left. So sometimes, you know, nailing the right intent, you know, but again, that's getting the pose correct and actually thinking about what you're doing going, okay, right. I'm going to make this guy take two steps, jump, land, and then take another step. And you go, okay, well, what foot is he going to jump off of? What foot is he going to land on? What's okay? Go. That's what I'm doing, and not midway going. Huh? What if? Would it look cool if he maybe bent a little bit, and then all of a sudden your footwork doesn't work, and this and that, and I don't know. I think that'd be a great exercise. Yeah, I was going to say it's to me. Um, it's learning how to um do like straight ahead animating in your head, mm. but but you know like like this is what I want to do. It's really like a straight process, and then learn how to uh, break down, uh, break it down into a process. How you could put it on screen, yeah. <clears throat> and then and another exercise which uh, I don't know how I shared with uh, many people what you can do to learn how to think faster or how to create ideas faster is um, learn to animate and have a timer. You know, put a, yeah. literally put a physical. You know that that's old school. Yeah. Um, put uh, put a put a clock right next to your desk and say, okay, I have exactly three hours to finish this shot. Yeah. That's it. You're going to learn to be like, okay, I'm going to, you're going to think efficiently. You're going to think fast and you're going to think, you know, like what is the best way to get this idea yeah. clear and across to the audience? Yeah. Try that for, for a month. And, and I think you might see, um, you know, you won't overthink things for no reason, unless it, it, it requires it. I mean, thinking and planning is, is like, by far, That's, one of yeah. the most important process. But, uh, you know, when you've been doing it for so long, pro you know, projects that don't have that luxury of, you know, a lot of time, you learn to develop that over the years. But you can you can still train yourself at home or or even at your current job just by using a, a clock. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I still do. OK, what and I actually say this in my head is, OK, what can I achieve by lunchtime? <laughs> And I, I look at my shot and I go, right, I want to send this to my soups. I want to do the legs of this, the that, the that, the that. Okay, I'm not going to have time to do that. So that's not that important. Then you prioritize and you go, right, okay, this is what I'm going to, this is what is realistically achievable. And you learn over time. Obviously, like when you get out of school, you might not be able to, to figure out how much you can do, but, you know, keep track of that. And if you go, oh, I didn't, you know. I didn't make my goal. Well, why didn't I make it? Was, did I did I dilly dally? Did I make mistakes? Did I crash? Or did I have too high expectations? Okay, well, we'll see how tomorrow goes. Or we'll see how the afternoon goes. And that's that's a way to keep track and actually be able to, to, to be smart about your time. And one thing, Richie, you said, funny enough, Dave Ubar, uh was one, one of the tricks that he had said to me. And I was like, oh, I've never really done that. And I thought it was really, really smart. And actually, that's something that I've done on Lego is he would say when he gets a piece of audio, and I'm not sure if he still does that, so we'll see. Um, he'd say he'd close his eyes, put the, the headphones on, you know, no, no images of nothing, and just play the audio over and over. And try to get an idea. 
is he gonna we're gonna hit the accent with that you know with a hey, whatever or am I gonna do it this way am I, and kind of try to visualize what you know like the acting so that you're not hitting every beat just because you're just animating oh yeah there's an accent here I'll lift the hand oh I'll lift the other hand okay I'll lift the head on that one and I'll put that and so it becomes just over animated mm -hmm. so he would actually try to do that and then envision you know kind of give a really good idea and it doesn't mean that that's the the blueprint for what you're going to do exactly but it's at least a really great way to start and understand what your audio is and what it's supposed to communicate and then that's you know like richie was saying that's you know planning it's super important yeah it's also feeling out the sound i mean you're really yeah you know um i wrote a little piece um like what what you know vision so, means to I, me hey <laughs> <Okay. laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's going to hurt when you come here. Um, <laughs> um, I wrote a piece. Um, <laughs> I almost lost my focus here. Um, you wrote a piece it, about audio yeah. listening? No, not audio listening, but it's like really be able to visualize it completely and, and to be able to believe it as it was your own experience. So I think, you know, listening to that audio clip is not just thinking where to hit it, but it's almost feeling like if it was really your your clip or you saying it so yeah I, you know yeah now did any of your has, has any of your uh, workflow changed throughout the years from some of that here or did it change from film to film um no, i always try to work the same way because that's how i like to work and i know i can be efficient certain productions change the way um sometimes you present the work some directors are, are very comfortable watching very rough blocking some directors need to see more polished work so sometimes, you know, even for your first pass, you actually have to add more breakdowns, more, you know, more polish, um, which is fine. Um, you kind of adapt to the productions, I think. Um, but I'd always, you know, I, ideally for me, um, so on Guardians, uh, we had the environment where we could sit down with the animation director and pitch a lot of ideas and kind of work them out like before we even started. So as a lead on the show, I would sit down, I'd, I'd, I'd sit down with my guys, I'd talk with my guys and go, what do you want to do with your shot? Because I'd allocate the shots. And they'd say, oh, I really want to do this, I want to do that. And we're like, oh, well, maybe that'd be too much. No, that's a great idea, let's keep that. Okay, and then I'd go in with my, my piece of paper and I'd pitch the ideas to the animation director. And then following that, we'd have like a chat and then, okay, this is a yes, this is a no, eh, try to convince me. And then I'd go back to the guys and go, right, this is the yes, this is the no, and then we'd shoot reference. And we'd shoot as a team. A, it was great because we could bond. We had a great team. We had, you know, great chemistry together, and it was fun. And then we'd film the stuff, and then different people would act out different things for other animators, and you get the animator to direct his own shot in a way, which was kind of fun. And then I could, I'd could, oversee the whole thing, so sometimes kind of step in or go, right, well, I think we're going a little too far, or let's get that guy because I think he does that character really well, or... And then I'd assemble the sequence together and actually build a sequence with the reference material. And um, that was fantastic. Uh, that was really, really good. Because A, we had a very clear idea. And then when I present the work um, to the animation director, he knew what was coming. So he knew what to expect. And then he'd see it and go, great, that works. That, oh, OK, see, you didn't convince me. Or, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Blew me away. <laughs> but, um, so that, that was really cool because we could save time and, in, in, you know, when productions are a bit tight, that's when you can kind of muscle through stuff and, and kind of get through it. And that was, that was really good. Um, okay. But not every production you know, allocates for A, the time with the animation directors. Sometimes their workload is enormous and you just don't have that time. Sometimes, you know, uh, a sequence takes on a life of its own and it needs to become something else because it needs to mean more in a film or means less. And so... How was your quota for Lego Movie? Uh, I think, oh, it varied. Um, I think we had 10 seconds, eight, 10 seconds. But we had, we start like most production. It started off where we're not hitting the quota, not hitting the quota. And all of a sudden, boom, we start blowing the quota out of the water. You know, some guys would animate like just beautiful work, just first pass. And that would go right through. Like sometimes you go, okay, well, just fix the intersection there and then don't touch it again. So. Did, did you find with the, I want to use the term more simplistic style, did that give less revisions back and forth and, and get things through quicker or no? <laughs> Not always because it's, <laughs> it's easy for a director to go, huh, let's try this. Okay. Because your guy turned it around in the afternoon. Uh. So there's that, there's that, you know, and it's also, I think every director is looking for the best idea always. 
And so if, if they have like, oh, I've got two more days on this shot. Well, let's try three more versions because you can do it in half a day. <laughs> that would happen. And it's fine because often you'd, you'd be happier with the shot at the end. Mm-hmm. And God, it is better. How was it like working with these directors uh, on the movie? Um, we dealt a lot like, prim- like primarily with uh, Chris McKay. And he was fantastic. Like in terms of uh, uh, he's a very creative person. He... He's very animated, and like in, in, the, in the theater, he'd be in front acting stuff out and getting kind of excited about the stuff. And sometimes just for like, oh, can you just raise the eyebrows? He'd go on a, a really funny rant for like five minutes. <laughs> so it was actually a lot of fun. Um, the other guys were, were back uh, back in L.A. or, or um, kind of busy over here. So um, they would do – he would spend most – like he would, he, would, uh, he would have a lot of meetings with them. So we didn't get that much time with the directors, but when we did, they're really nice. Gotcha. Did you get to be able to animate on a lot of characters, or were you on specific ones, or how did that work? Um, so Animal Logic works on sequences. So if you get a sequence and you get all these characters, that's you know that's just how it is. So like on most productions, you will touch quite a few characters. Um, if your team does well with one character, they try to kind of push those your way. But um, so on this one, yeah. Yeah, we got to do. I got to do a Batman. I got to do uh, Emmett, um, Lucy, Juvius. Yeah, yeah, I got to do. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So, who is with some of your favorite characters to work on? Oh, uh, Batman is always fun. Yeah. Um, Lucy was cool because she had a lot of the fighting stuff, and and she was of all the characters, she's the most agile. So when it was time to do the two D cheats, where you know, in the, in a passing frame, you kind of break the arms off and kind of do motion blur stuff, where you know, no one will see it unless you pause and frame by frame it. She was the one to do that stuff more, so that was kind of cool. What do you um, mean more agile? It was pretty much a similar rig, right? Yeah, but in, in terms of agile, meaning the character. Like, forget uh, forget the actual figurine. She's okay. the one doing flips and doing kicks. And gotcha, gotcha. And, 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 and where where you could hide stuff in the, in, in the blurry frames. So. I gotcha. Okay. Now, yeah. you mentioned it, and I read it in one of the articles as well. You guys didn't use motion blur per se, but you yeah. used something that was called brick blur. We had brick blur on, uh, yes. So what is essentially, that? Uh, the master builders, uh-huh. the people that have seen the movie, um, they they when they start building stuff and they they kind of start going really fast, they have this almost like a motion blur trail, like almost like a two D trail. So um, it was a tool that was built for us where you could translate a character really fast and turn on the tool, and it would almost it would pretty much take the colors of the character and create these brick blurs. Now the worry at the begin at the beginning there was the big debate: should we put Motion blur or like brick blur whenever there's fast movements and all the animators are like, yes, 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 cool, cool, cool. But then they decided it's going to be insane and there's going to be like blurs everywhere. So they, it got cut down to the, to the master builders and when they would build stuff. Okay. So okay. when you first see Lucy, there's a tiny bit in there and that's just a hint because they didn't want to overdo it. And then later on in the film, there's more and more. Now, is that something you guys saw? Post render, or is that something that could work in the OpenGL? Uh, that was in the software. So okay. they, Dave and, and Jim worked really hard on first of all developing a style that the directors liked, because they were very very picky about it. Where they're like, ah, it's too it's too much like too you know it, it it should feel like some dude is putting bricks together <laughs> to make it look like it's a blur. So because we wanted bends, so we're like, can we get the bricks to bend and so we get a curve? No, Legos break don't no you know they don't bend so. <laughs> That's what you're getting. So, okay. Um, and then you could try to angle them on your frame. So if you pick a frame where you're like this, the next frame is there, the next frame is there, then hopefully when, the, you know, you kind of get a bit of a bend. So okay. it was fun. It was fun to do that stuff. All right. Yeah. Now, what was the most fun working on this project? In terms of scenes or like as a... As a whole. I mean, because like I said, it's a hilarious movie. Yeah. So walking away from it, what was some of the most fun for you? Well, like I was saying before, like you just find yourself giggling all the time, looking at the characters. And like I had, um, uh, I worked on the, our team had the construction site. Okay. So we had to make these little dance cycles. And after a while, we're like, ah, the ones that we have in the library, they're not, they're not what we need. So let's make more. So I ended up making, I think like seven or eight, but it would take you 40 minutes (laughs) to do one. And they're just hilarious because they're like these eight frame cycles. And you're like, this is they look so they, they look at this little idiot. It's so great, <laughs> and you're just hitting play on your machine. You know, you're not even play blasting it, and it's just hilarious. And I, it, it's that kind of stuff where you almost feel like a kid playing with the toys. That's great, and that's kind of how it felt when you're you know when you're kind of putzing around. I don't know, it was great. 
what were some of the other rules that you guys had as far as the movement? Because I know, and this is in the trailer too, where he's having to do his jumping jacks to start off the morning, right? <laughs> it's, oh, it's great. He's up in midair, kind of yeah. like it, like you said, like it would be someone holding it and moving it up in the up in yeah. the air, kind of twisting. Yeah. Were there other rules that you were able to do that with, or no? They have to be stationed, like if there were click to a block or how, how what were some of the other rules? Well, I, I think like for action sequences, you, you want to keep a certain level of danger for the, this action sequences to feel real or not real, but like there's an actual danger for a character. So you want the audience to be like, Oh no, we need to get away. So if the dynamics feel kind of good and kind of realistic, I think the level of danger goes up. But then if it's a funny thing where you guys should be hanging up in the air and then it's, then you do it. You could do it. Okay. Yeah. Um, there was small, you know, there was a small rules where they didn't want to see the pegs when you separated the characters. Mm. So the pegs in the middle, um, that was something that we weren't allowed to do. And we kept trying to do and <laughs> getting caught. <laughs> but but uh, um, again, for squash, you know, you want to squash and stretch a character. You want to pull the body, pull the head and then burk. Uh -huh. And in the end, it didn't, you didn't need it. <laughs> you just had to get your spacing right on, on, on your positions. But um yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of rules, to be honest. Okay. Because I started thinking about it as well. With no like squash and stretch or things like that, you would typically lose out on weight. You know, was there any things where, like, for example, with Wild Style, where, you know, she's having to jump, but you're having to do something different to sell that she's kind of landing versus just floating? Yeah. Yeah, well, you rock on the, you rock on the heel. And, it, you know, imagine if you do stop motion at home, you'd use a piece of whatever blue tack or something and you put the heel down and then you'd roll it forward and you'd bend the body a bit more mm. or you try to do you know this is the body you can bend it in half but if you keep your pivot point at the base all of a sudden you've got you got compression nice right? uh -huh. but it, except that you use the face so if you have to have the face in shot that's a whole other <laughs> story so it's all these little challenges but i found people did for, for yeah, i think everybody on the show we had very very talented crew um, people saw those as, as fun challenges mm -hmm. and it, it, you know, and, and you'd find, sometimes you'd look at other people's work and you, and you see the way they solve the problems and the way they solve the problems. So interesting and so fun. Cause like, Oh, cool. Look, he just split the legs and then tilted this. And then it kind of looks like, Oh, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. Like, Oh, okay. I've got an action shot coming. I, I want to do something better than him. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about pixel a little bit if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Okay. Rick. Jump in here. What's the question you have for him? Well, really, I wanted uh, so because Matt's been uh, been wearing the spandex suit. <laughs> yes, he's been wearing he's been wearing the spandex suit. I'm sure he looks better than I do. <laughs> um, so yeah, he's gonna be talking at at Pixel here in Quebec in April, and I wanted uh, you know wanted him to share a little bit of his experience as as an actor, you know, within the suit and how he uses that why he's animating as well and what he's going to be talking about during pixel. So Matt, you know, take so it you away. Have some motion capture background. Um, well, it's oddly <clears> enough. <throat> I've always been the one picked for these things and it's happened a bunch of times very randomly. So I've done some on video games, uh, that we done in Montreal. Um, I think one time it was just to help out hold pads for this boxing actor that we got. And then they're like, Ooh, we need to do more stuff. Do you want to help out again? I was like, sure. So I did some acting. And then on Guardians, like I was saying, we were acting a lot of a lot of the workout. So I, it, it, I became more and more comfortable. I'm not going to say that I'm a good actor or anything like that, but uh, just get more comfortable in front of the camera and get kind of the results that the soups want and stuff like that. And then on Transformers 3, uh, I was asked, because essentially everybody else was busy except me. And they said, Matt, you've got no work. Do you, do you mind coming down and just doing a bit of mocap for us? And it ended up working out really well. They liked what I did. And then they, I've been kind of doing a lot of the mocap for them. And so I think what Richie, you know, is, is interested in, and I think is, you know, like I, I'm an animator. So when people are like, oh, mocap, mocap, like I'm still the same as the other animators. But mocap has its place and used correctly could be a really great tool for production to allocate time for people to focus on what needs to be animated. So how was it used in something like ILM on Transformers? Is it for pre-production layout or how's what's that? Um, well, they're, they're using a lot of the background characters for Transformers. Like if you look at the animation, even when we are animating everything by hand, it has to be very realistic. Mm -hmm. Like the dynamics have to be correct. Uh, then, and you know, they, they scrutinize the work. 
like a lot because the product has to be up there. Um, so sometimes, you know, sometimes it's mocap, but I mean, it, they pick and choose and they do it correctly. Um, and then also what I think has been good is that a, the, the animation directors that we have that are with me on stage when we are shooting is that they, they help me a lot. And we look at the, what the shots are going to be. And as an animator, I can say, right, well, I need to play it this way. Because I need to have my body facing this way, and it needs to play the camera, and I need to play for a composition, so that when the guy gets the you know the mocap take, he doesn't have to spend eight hours just repositioning what I'm doing. And I think that's that's going to be part of the talk and what some of the stuff that I can share. So just having some of that experience with motion capture, then. Yeah. Gotcha. I think that experience as um, for those who haven't had a chance to be in the suit, be able to act and really see what you're doing can be used for your performance, mm. even doing pieces for yourself as, you know, like you said, background characters, you know, if you just yeah. need some ambient motion or if the small, these small little actions, you can jump in a suit and put it in. And, you know, there's something that we do often, especially in games. And yeah. that's how you got started, uh, you know, using motion capture and, you know, that that experience, knowing how to act, uh, you know, with motion capture and then using it, you know, whether you use it completely as mocap or if you use it and you're extracting it and using it as keyframe or using it as reference. I think it's something that's really important that I want other animators to to learn and hear from, especially from Matt coming from a, you know, heavily keyframe background, but now seeing the the beauty of and the beauty of motion capture and what you can do with it. So, yeah. Okay. Another question here. Warren Seeley asks, what keeps you going as an animator? Um, I've been, I think, fortunate enough to work with very talented people and you see the work that they do. And, and even if you're their lead or you're in a position, you know, like that, you, you still see their work and you go, wow, that's really cool. That's a great idea. Um, and you kind of want to implement the same thing. And, and I think I've always, I've always been, you know, I always observe people and, and, and things and, and you notice stuff and go, oh, that's really interesting. And then, and then putting those ideas into shots or into films. And it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's, I'm still fascinated by a lot of that stuff. I still find it really interesting. Do you find yourself still very inspired? Um, I mean, there's there's certain times where where you will get a shot and you go, oh, I've done this action about forty times. <laughs> like I've animated this before. I know exactly what I'm doing. And those are the times I think where you rely on your experience. You get the shot done, and then you move on to the more fun one. As opposed to, you know, I've, I've I'm still doing walk cycles on productions. You come in, that's the work that they give you. So you got to do it. You do it. And those are maybe the times where you put in the headphones. Like we're still. And but sometimes you can you can still find something interesting and you go, you know what, I've never done it that way. And then you do a little something different, you go, that's even better. I've done that better. And that's that I still get I still get joy out of and you still look at it and you go, Oh, and, and there's still stuff where you it's still hard. There's certain animations and you've done it before and you go, Wow, it's still taking me three days. <laughs> this is infuriating. <laughs> but it's it's part of it. it's part of the challenge and it's part of I don't know. I gotta tell you that though, I'm sure that gives people a lot of hope because I've, I've been a student here at iAnimate before as well. And I, it blows my mind when I hear guys like you have been in the industry for that long, work on some high end film, still go, it is still difficult to do this here. And so just, I gotta let you know, I'm sure that gives a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the thing is, 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 is what you get to learn along the way is how to get through those, maybe those times, or there's days where I'm like, I think I'm a fraud. Yeah. This is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and you come back the next morning and 15 minutes in, you're like, well, what was the problem? <laughs> and it's just, it's just also kind of learning to let go of certain things and how to be brutal with your work. And there's all these tools that you learn along the way that, that kind of help you <laughs> through the difficult moments. <laughs> <laughs> What's been one of your favorite films to work on? Um, Despero was a lot of fun. Um, Despero was great because that was, like I said, like I, I think I – that was one of the like I might have been going through a bit of a low in my career at that point, and and I was so inspired going into work, and and I'd go home and be thinking about my shot which I hadn't done in years, because you know you get to a point where you can kind of turn it on and off I guess, but I'd be going home going okay right what am I gonna do with that little mouse like what am I gonna do, because I could do more than what just the shot is supposed and then you get kind of excited about it. Um, and Guardians was great fun uh, because I guess I think. 
what I was talking about the process that I like to the way I like to work that worked that was exactly how the people above me wanted to work mm. so in terms of the workflow that was great and I, and I love the work and I thought uh, I was lucky like I love the characters that we got to work on so we worked with uh, Naira which is one of the villains mm -hmm. and the bad brother the evil brother yeah. so that was that was really good fun so uh, that was a very good experience are there certain kind of shots that you gravitate towards as far as uh like you mentioned here, more villainous or humorous or uh, you well, like it all? Because you, you, you spend a month doing a very crazy action shot and it's so much fun and there's fighting and there's this. And then after a while, you kind of go, oh, I need quiet now. <laughs> and I just get a head and shoulder shot with some really sad emotion. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I just like doing – I think I like I like doing it all. Like it's, it's really fun. Like I mean on Transformers, that's another show that I'm having a great time. Like I got – fantastic shots on the third one mm -hmm. where uh, there's one shot um we were in dailies and after dailies my soup said oh maddie can you stay back we've got to tell you brief you about your new shots so i got three shots in a row which in vfx doesn't always happen and i was so giddy i couldn't sit down for about 10 15 minutes <laughs> i'm not joking i just kept annoying my neighbor going dude i could make him do that or he could do that and then it could roll into this and then and i was so excited so it still happens, and I don't think that really goes away. Just out of curiosity, mm -hmm. how is it working on those rigs, the Transformers rigs? It seems like they're crazy insane with the amount of uh, metal on them and the ability to be able to transform. And uh, well, it's it's like any like any other studio. So they they've got you've got rig resolutions. Mm -hmm. So obviously your base rig won't have all the metal parts or the moving parts. Okay, but are you having to? Are there certain other controllers that? transform it for you or you're having that's to... a bit of magic that i okay. love us. okay <laughs> i was about to raise up the red flag there we're okay. <laughs> okay we'll leave that here then <laughs> any other questions rick um no i just have stories that we could probably talk about but i'll tell you about the time i really really scared richie at work let's hear it oh next time okay okay <laughs> <laughs> We'll, we'll keep we, our we, listeners ready. Matt, for the Matt wasn't the same person. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you you got you want to share with us? Uh, nothing off the top of my head. I mean, you know, I just hope. I mean, it it's been really fun hearing how much people enjoy the Lego film, mm -hmm. and and it's it's great when I think maybe the one thing I will I would say is is when you do work on a show where you can recognize that. It's kind of a rare opportunity just to kind of take advantage and, and try to enjoy it as much as you can, even though sometimes you're frustrated, your shots aren't going the way you want, maybe there's notes and you're like, you don't agree with them, whatever it is. It's still when you, you stop and look at it, like it's, it's a very, it was this very special film. The directors in this case did not want to do like a, this is a big uh, brand name. We can easily make all of our money first weekend. They were adamant about making a good film. That's and and having a story like uh, Emmett is my favorite character in the film, and it's rare that the main character is. Mm. I think he's he's just a delight. I love oh, him. Yeah, yeah. And so when you get to work with people like that, it's 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 really really great. And and maybe taking the moment to just go, oh, this is really cool. I get to do this. This is really cool. Just kind of take the time to enjoy it. Maybe that sounds good to me. All right, Matt. Well, hey, I, again, I know you're busy and we always appreciate our guests and we've got just a lot of feedback on the podcast and people really enjoying them. So right. I know this will be another one in that lineup that people appreciate. So thank you very much for your time. Well, it was my pleasure. It was really great talking to you guys. All right. Yeah, thanks. Matt. See you soon. See you. Yeah. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.